everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for our presentation on effective leadership. I'm Melissa Samuels, Director of Alumni Programs at the Albany Alumni Association. Before we get started today, I wanted to review just a few housekeeping items. Uh, on the bottom tab, uh, you'll see we have, uh, on the bottom bar rather, you'll see we have a couple of tabs. Um, we have a chat uh, tab open today. Uh, feel free to maybe uh, pop in there and let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, the second tab that we'll be using today is the Q&A tab. Uh, we will save some time at the end of the program for your questions. Um, please be sure to type your questions in the Q&A tab, not the chat tab, otherwise we might miss them. Um, so uh, we will leave at least 15 minutes for, um, for Q&A. So I'd like to share a little bit about our speaker today. Uh, Sharon Small is class of 2002. Sharon is the owner of Empowering Success, career coaching and consulting, a firm that works with managers on developing the skills needed to be successful leaders. She's also advised C-suite level executives and is a former executive committee member of SEC Rough Riders Toastmasters International. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, so excited to get started. Great, thank you so much, Melissa, for that wonderful introduction. You're Hello, welcome. everyone, all my great Danes and you Albany, Albany alumni. Um, thank you so much for sharing your afternoon, your lunchtime with me. My desire is to give you some really good nuggets as it pertains to the topic of effective leadership. There is so much information that can be covered when we think about leadership. And we have a short window of time together today. So my goal is to cover three specific areas of leadership, and then we will explore your specific questions, experiences you may have, and also really to get everyone looking at their own leadership styles, challenges, and ways in which they can really help their team feel valued and move forward um, with the challenges that everyone is experiencing right now. So we will go ahead and get started. So hopefully everyone can see the presentation that I have pulled up on my screen. So today, again, we're going to talk about effective leadership. And I know Melissa went through and discussed some of the housekeeping items. Um, let's go ahead. So here are the three things we're going to cover today. We're going to discuss healthy dynamics as it pertains to leadership. We're going to also cover addressing challenges that leaders face and also recognizing the hard work and efforts um, that your team has pulled together during these um, unprecedented times and achievements made. So Melissa already covered a lot of this information. If you have any technical issues, um, please, please, please use the Q&A feature to send a note off to Stephanie, who we are definitely thrilled to have us joining, have us with us today. Um, and I encourage everyone to take notes. I believe in having that information that discuss, that discuss referred back to at a later time. So here's a thought on leadership as we begin our journey together. I found this quote and this really, really deeply resonated with me. It's by well-known business executive, Jack Welsh. And the quote is, before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. So I really want you to think about that concept as we begin our journey together today that shift from developing and growing yourself to shifting and having an impact on others. So to get started, we have a poll question. So with our first poll, the question, it appears on the slide, 
I'd like to get a sense of how long our attendees on today's call have been in a leadership position. And right now the poll is being launched. I can see responses coming in. And the choices or options are anywhere from aspiring leader, so that's someone who might have zero years of experience, to a new leader, someone with one to three years of experience, someone who's a little more developed, so at that mid-level leadership um, role, so four to seven years, the next option, eight to 15 years, and then we have our very seasoned senior leaders who have 16 or more years of experience. So I see the numbers are still being tallied. Um, another five seconds to share your results. And I think everyone can see these now. So we have a nice spread of leaders on today's call. Um, I see we have a lot of people who are aspiring leaders. So you're at the great place in terms of you have the opportunity to learn about what are those attributes that makes a great leader um, early on as you think about how you want to navigate your careers. Um, we also have our second, our top number, which would be four to seven years of experience leader-wise. Our third results would be the one to three year mark and our fourth would be eight to 15 years. So thank you so much. Um, everyone for participating in the poll and getting me a sense of where you are in your leadership journey, because I really want to make sure that we touch on information that is going to apply to everyone, but also really thinking about what has brought you to the place you currently are. If you are someone who has those four to seven years of experience, those eight to 15 years of experience, and 16 years or more, because my takeaway from that is you have been doing something right, <laughs> probably a number of things very, very right. So we're going to learn from each other during this experience. So thank you. Okay, so stories and experiences. When I am working with my private clients, I always encourage them to think about what have they encountered in the past. Um, I find that the solutions to many of the challenges or the problems or just the new experiences that one faces, really those solutions can be derived from things of the past in terms of reflection. So I'm gonna throw up there just a little food for thought for everyone. Now, this is not a formal poll question, so don't feel compelled to respond or look for anything that'll pop up. But I just want everyone on today's meeting to think about me, your presenter. So Melissa did a wonderful job of sharing my bio and background information. I just want some thoughts in terms of how you think my leadership journey began. So here are the options. We have when I studied um, it in graduate school at Columbia University, so when I pursued my master's degree there. Did my leadership journey begin when I was in my first human resources leadership role? When I started my own business 12 years ago? Did it begin when I facilitated a wonderful, wonderful cohort um, out in Westchester County a number of times um, for professionals uh, from different sectors and different career levels. Or finally, none of the above. So I'll give everyone a moment to just ponder what the answer to that question may be. All right, give me another three seconds. And I see some chats coming in. All right, so here's the big moment. It actually began here. Now, I know we have a number of people who might have graduated a number of years ago from you, Albany, as did I. Um, so this image may look vaguely familiar. This
this is actually um, a very old photo I found of the dining hall, an Indian quad in Tuscarora Hall. And as you can see, we have signage that was appropriate for this time of year. It's, it's amazing that we're having this um, presentation now, but we have Great Danes, go Great Danes. So homecoming was going on around that time and you might be able to make out the date. Now, it's interesting. I mentioned earlier that reflection is a big part of reminding oneself of where did things originate? How did things start? And at that time, I was a freshman at UAlbany. I was on my own for the first time and it was a lot to absorb and process to say the least. But I had a wonderful, wonderful RA who I happened to share a suite with. And I learned a tremendous amount from her in terms of leadership. She was amazing in terms of, she really was committed to her job. She was committed to the students and the dorm and floor that she oversaw as a resident assistant. And she was a really, really good model to emulate. And I actually thought a little bit more about the experience when I became an RA the following year. I thought about the RDs who I reported to. So, you know, thinking about my RA, Nicole, the RDs I reported to, um, people like Karen Acosta and James Hyde, and just really wonderful leaders that made me say, hmm, there's a lot that goes into maintaining order in a freshman dorm at what was considered the number one party school at that time in the country. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that go into it, but core essence was people were committed, people cared. Another part of my leadership journey began my junior and senior year of my time at SUNY Albany, which was when I decided to become a crisis hotline counselor um, with Middle Earth. So if anyone can think of Dr. Chimini and that wonderful program that extended beyond campus, but really, you know, the Albany community as a whole, in terms of just really providing that support um, via that hotline, I really acquired tremendous listening skills during that wonderful experience. And I can absolutely say those listening skills have carried through tremendously in terms of what I brought into my experiences as a leader um, post SUNY Albany. So let's talk about dynamics of leadership in terms of the healthy ones. So on the slide, I have saw a breakdown of effective versus ineffective leadership. And on this list over here to the left, this, these are just a few things that contribute to a healthy, um, effective leader. So an individual who has a vision, um, and I have in parentheses, there is transformational. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we continue. Um, serves as a model for others to emulate. So I shared my RA experience and the fact that I had someone whose behavior was one in which I said, you know, that's what a powerful um, leader in this setting looks like. The next piece I have in there is someone who listens. Very, very key, very, very key. Listening skills are so important when an individual is an effective leader. Um, someone who encourages sharing of ideas and input. Um, they clearly communicate in expectations. They coach their team members. Very, very important. They come from a place of honesty and integrity. Um, it's funny, I had brunch with someone who is a former president of an international bank. He's retired now. And he said, honesty and integrity were so, so important and key during his time as a leader um, for that organization. And then confident. People respond well when they have a leader who is confident. So someone who, again, they're confident, they're sure, you can trust that they're going to lead you in the right direction. And then we have our list of ineffective behavior. So everyone in this uh, meeting has had 
work experience and opportunities in which they've been led by others in the past. So this list to the right could really be much longer and I'm sure everyone could add additional bullet points to it. But here are just a few things that I've observed over time. So someone who yells, screams, demands, they intimidate others. They don't provide feedback or the only time they do provide feedback is when they have something negative to say. So if things go wrong, that's the only time you hear from them. They don't convey expectations. You don't know what your leader wants or what the point is, how you contribute to the bigger picture. Um, they're not adaptable. They might be very set in their ways. It's their way or the highway. Um, they're uncertain. So when you're thinking about a leader who's not sure of what they want, it makes it hard for you to meet their expectations. Um, and similarly, someone who's indecisive. So maybe they want one thing today and that changes tomorrow. So that can, that can add to confusion within one's team. Now, I want everyone to take a moment to think about who are your models? So I want us to shift gears and think about those effective leaders and those positive behaviors. So on the left, I have a listing of just questions for you to think about. So first I'd like you to ask yourself, who are the positive leaders who you've encountered throughout any point in your life? What about their leadership style really resonated with you? How do you model their positive attributes yourself as a leader? And then lastly, what can you do differently? So there I'm referring to what's your spin on it? What's your secret sauce? What is it that you're adding to that formula that makes it unique and authentic for you? And over to the right, I just have some, a list of things to generate some ideas and thoughts. So you can think about your past or current boss or bosses, colleagues or teammates, informal leaders, coaches you may have had, and friends and family members. Um, you know, when I thought about this list for myself, I thought about the wonderful people I've interacted with professionally, but also personally. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I started my business in honor of my dad um, 12 years ago. And I think about his personality and how he was as, as an amazing human being and as a father, but also he had amazing leadership skills. I learned how to deal with difficult personalities via him. And it's interesting. I think about my clients who I coach and helping them to navigate their ways through dealing with challenging personalities and students I might advise, um, you know, with my organizational clients, it's, again, really thinking from a foundational level, from a fundamental level, what skills have you acquired over time that has really made an impression on you and that you carry through in the work that you do? So here's a formal definition of leadership, just food for thought. So here we have, it's a process of social influence which maximizes the efforts of others towards achievement of a goal. And this is just a simple definition that I pulled from Forbes on leadership. Now, leadership can be broken into two categories. So for some of our seasoned leaders on today's webinar, I'm sure this will be very, very familiar to you. We have transactional and we have transformational. So what is meant by those two terms? Well, transactional, those are really the, the focus being on the day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, they're really focused on, okay, this is today's to-do list. They're navigating their way through the action items and they're checking off things as they come up. Transactional also can be a bit quantitative. So their focus are on hitting metrics, numbers, and achieving goals that way. And transactional leaders tend to be a bit reactive. So it's interesting. I was speaking to a friend of mine who is a very senior level um, leader at his organization. And his biggest challenge since 
March for many people has been putting out fires. So operating in a very reactive manner to things that just come up unexpectedly on a daily basis. Um, now we're going to shift gears to the transformational piece. So the goal, the goal for any leader should be to have that transformational view and mindset. So what's meant by transformational is really thinking big picture. So you're a visionary. You tend to be more focused on the qualitative items and in alignment with that big picture thinking, being proactive. So rather than putting out fires as they arise, really thinking about planning for the future, planning for goals and how you can achieve those goals. What milestones will you put in place to say, okay, these are the strides that you're making with your team. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I did wanna share a leadership model or framework for um, people to think about. So there are two pieces here. One is VUCA Prime, and you might have heard of this model. And then we have the basic VUCA model. So just to give a quick explanation, VUCA, it's a framework. It's been around for a number of years. Um, whether we're talking about the original framework or the prime model, we're using the same letters. So VUCA, the original version, really is, was an acronym for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, but this prime model, we see we're using the same letters, but they have different meanings with the prime version. So I would say with prime, the takeaways are a bit more positive. We have vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. So these are different ways of thinking about that framework or that concept. Um, down here, again, if you want more information or just to elaborate on the original model versus the prime model, um, here's an article from Harvard Business Review that you can take a look at that will give you more insight on both. Now, let's shift gears a bit and talk about challenges. So we're gonna shift to poll question number two. So what I want everyone to do is I want everyone to think about what is the biggest challenge you are facing as a leader? And on here, we have different options. So we have communication, conveying expectations, delegating, and time management. So I see the numbers are still coming in. Okay, thank you everyone. So the results are in and everyone can see them. So 17% of you identified your biggest challenge as communication, 28% identified um, conveying expectations as your biggest challenge, 20% um, shared that delegating is your biggest challenge. And the top winner, which comes as no surprise, is time management. That seems to be the biggest challenge for everyone. And I would say time management, in my experience, it's always been a challenge for many leaders. Um, now, in the wake of everything that's happening as a result of the pandemic, Time management is even more of an issue because there's a blur that takes place. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about boundaries, but you know, it seems like people are always on at this point in time and people are being stretched in ways they have not been stretched before. So thank you for sharing your results. We're gonna talk a little bit more about how these items blend in and factor in with the, um, you know, the, the theme of being an effective leader. So
So here are some common challenges in addition to what you shared in the poll. We have ambiguity, communication. Again, that was a very, very big one. The next one I have in here is trust. This is very significant. Boundaries, resolving issues, and operating in this remote slash virtual environment. So I wanna to pause to really think about and talk about each one of these a bit. Um, when we think about leadership and we think about communication, there are ways in which individuals have had to pivot as a result of what's taking place, you know, currently, but overall. So here are some things I've found to be effective in terms of communication. Good habits that leaders get into in terms of communication are, it should be frequent, it should be often, and it should be timely. Frequent, often, and timely. And here's what I mean by that. We are all overwhelmed tremendously with the day-to-day -day responsibilities of our jobs, our lives, personal, professional, etc. Um, you want to make sure that you're carving time out to communicate with your team. And that can vary depending on the dynamics of your team and the culture of your team. Um, what I found some individuals experience tremendous success with is to have some kind of regular check-ins with their staff. So that might be weekly, that might be bi-weekly, um, just to keep those lines of communication open and also to help establish some level of regularity and normalcy in terms of if you know you have a weekly meeting with your boss or your subordinate or a colleague, you can prepare for those meetings. You can come to those meetings with information that you either need answers on, um, challenges that you're facing, or just opportunities to get feedback on how things worked or what was the outcome of those things. Um, next is trust. Now, this is a big one. Um, the reason why I say that is trust is a vital part of any healthy group or team dynamic. So we're in a virtual environment. And one thing I am aware of is some leaders are challenged because they're not sure what their teams are doing. They don't know if their teams are working on the items they expect them to. And that ties right into the communication piece. Again, are you clearly articulating what needs to happen? Are you helping your team members prioritize? Are you soliciting their input on what they think is a priority versus other things, since they might have a better read on what's going on, the dynamics taking place, and are, they might be closer to the, to the ground level to know what's happening. Um, boundaries. Now, I was hired um, at the beginning of this pandemic by an organization whose employees were literally working around the clock. They were responding to emails and text messages at 11 p.m. at midnight. They were very accessible. And there are situations where that might be needed, but also there are instances in which people might feel pressured to be on all the time and to constantly respond and to constantly communicate. So really think about as a leader, what kind of boundaries are you establishing for yourself? So if you're thinking about how you're delegating work to team members, how are you demonstrating trust in the teams that you support, but also how are you carving out boundaries for your employees and for your teams so that they do not get burnt out? Um, I had worked with an executive at a bank, this was a number of years ago, who did a very great job of driving results. However, his team was burnt out, very much so. And he had a very long-term relationship with his team members. So they were clear in his expectations and they knew how to grab the ball and run with it. And I coached this executive on just giving them the freedom and the space to do that. That's very, very key. If they make a mistake, coach them through how to repair that mistake, but 
there has to be that level of trust that exists so that you can let people, let your team show you what they're made of and what they can do. Um, we have resolving issues and also, like I said before, operating in this remote virtual environment comes with its own unique set of challenges. At the same time, I wanna point out, there's some conveniences to this work arrangement. So when we think about the fact that we don't all need to be in the same centralized location. If you're working with clients who are in different regions, connecting via Zoom or any kind of online platform, it can actually give you an opportunity to interact with them more. Um, now that this is the norm and everyone is pretty much meeting virtually versus someone needing to be in the office and potentially feeling excluded because they're not physically there with other team members. Now, again, thinking about that working virtually concept. Right now, we have an interesting dynamic in that there is a lot of siloed behavior and siloed um, just dynamics that are taking place. People are working in isolation. They're working constantly. They're juggling, you know, responding to their phones, responding to things via their computers, just always being plugged in. Um, again, here we have an image, someone just working on their own. Here we have an image of someone who, this is how she's working with her team. This is how she's connecting with others. It's via plugging in via you know an online presence. What you want to think about as leaders are ways in which you can create cohesion amongst your team regardless of the circumstances. So here I have a quick definition of cohesion. So very, very simply stated, it's just the act or state of cohering, uniting, or sticking together. Now you don't have to be in the same physical space for that to happen. We can have this experience, this feeling, this dynamic, as long as we're partnering with others and staying connected. So solutions. Your teams will surprise you, pleasantly so. Um, I've done a number of leadership activities and events over the years. And one of the most powerful takeaways I've had is really seeing what my team can do when I step away from the situation. So giving individuals the opportunity to think about their own solutions. Um, first, having them come up with solutions as individuals, and then I love group dynamics. So them sharing that information as part of a group and a team. So again, thinking about what do you need to do as an effective leader? So empower your team, convey to them that you trust them, that you support them, and that you believe in them and that they will come up with successful solutions um, during any situation they might find themselves in. Um, allow them to use their voice, encourage them to really be creative and think about ways to address challenges. Um, support them. Support them in any way that you can. Um, if they say they need something in particular or need an introduction or someone's an unresponsive and they know that you can get an answer, support them in that, um, in that interaction. Give them feedback regularly. As I said before, you don't want to be that ineffective leader who only shares feedback when something's gone wrong. The other thing I will say, um, having been in human resources, is a lot of times people only think about feedback either when something goes wrong or during performance evaluation time. And I know for many organizations, we're at that time of year where people have to think about, oh, well, what feedback can I offer? If we're thinking about 360s, how are they going to um, provide something substantive to their teams, to their peers, to their bosses. So really think about just making feedback a regular part of what you do. Your life will be so much easier. Also, ask them for feedback. This is really important. A lot of times people tend to operate on assumptions, not being clear on what they're doing and what they're doing well and what they might need to change. So 
I say the easiest thing to do, and I say this to my clients all the time, is to just ask the question so that you have the feedback you need to be successful and effective. So here's a few ingredients as we think about cohesiveness. So one, celebrate individual differences. I love group dynamics. That was one of my big takeaways from grad school. Um, you want that diversity. You want those different perspectives and ideas and opinions. Um, if everyone's thinking alike, you run the risk of running into groupthink. And when you have that dynamic, you're not prepared for other possibilities or challenges or solutions even that might work. So really think about individual differences and celebrate those on your team. Next, utilize the strengths of each person. So what I mean by that is think of setting your team members up for success. So if someone does a really great job of whatever it is, let them run with it. Let them take the lead on that. Now, that's not to say that you should not create stretch opportunities for your team members because I'm a big advocate is that, of that as well. That's how your team members learn and grow and develop. But really, you know, when you need some essence of stability, really tap into the strengths of each one of your team members and let them know that you recognize those strong attributes they possess. Um, the next point I have in there, support and integration. So we already talked about support quite a bit. What you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you're integrating your team um, to the extent that you can. Again, right now, everything is operating in a virtual capacity, but that doesn't mean you can't create opportunities to bring your teams together. Um, so the team meetings that might have taken place in person every Monday morning at the start of the day, okay, that might look a little differently and happen via Zoom. That might look like you using or becoming familiar with all the wonderful aspects of technology in terms of breaking your teams up into smaller groups using the groups feature. Um, just again, keep people connected, letting them know that they're not alone, letting them know that they're supported and also weaving some elements of fun into the experience as well. Um, as a result of what's taking place now, I've had the privilege and the opportunity to engage in many different online events and conferences that have really been tremendous fun. So the whole big annual event taking place at whatever location might not happen anymore, but that doesn't mean you can't create something that brings your team together and energizes them and excites them. And also, like I said before, healthy communication, another really, really big point. And lastly, celebrate wins together. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. So acknowledgement. As a leader, it is imperative that you acknowledge the hard work and efforts of your team. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is taking things for granted. You don't want to do that. Um, you want to acknowledge what your team has done, the strides they've made, and celebrate them. So I like this phrase. We have more recognizing and memorializing. So as a leader, it is vital that you acknowledge the efforts of your team. And I think there's that tendency to take things for granted and to just move along and not pause for a moment and say, hey, wait a minute, we've done some impressive things here. We were met with challenges, but we rose to the occasion, we tackled our way through it, and we've accomplished something. So as a leader, you want to make sure you are recognizing and memorializing those efforts. So again, weaving back in the communication piece, as a leader, you want to share those successes. You don't want to keep them to yourselves. So I will say this, sometimes leaders are privy to information that they may receive from higher ups within an organization. As a leader, it is really imperative that you communicate those wins that have been recognized by your boss or your boss's boss to your team members and let them know how their piece, their work, the, whatever they carved out, 
how it fits into the bigger picture puzzle and the significance of that. That's what's going to keep your members feeling encouraged and inspired. And they're gonna feel like they can do this. They can navigate their way through the challenges that they're faced with and that there can be a successful outcome. So here I have celebrate victories. Now my private coaching clients, they always hear me say, celebrate the many victories along the journey. It's not solely about the end goal. It's about each step you took and each win that you achieved along the way that really, you know, leaves you inspired and leaves you feeling like, okay, you can take the next step and the next step and the next step. So as a leader, what you want to do is you want to take inventory of those strides made regularly. That's really, really significant. You don't want to just do it when it comes to mind or when you're putting together performance evaluations, as I said before, you really want to make it a regular habit. Um, you can share those nuggets with your team members and I will leave it up to you. You can actually throw in the chat. What are some ways in which you have celebrated your team and acknowledged their efforts in the midst of this virtual environment we've been in? Um, I'd love to hear some, some thoughts. Um, when everything was in an office environment, I heard of some really, really creative and interesting and innovative ways in which people supported their teams in person, but now that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I will share something with you that I thought was really, really nice. I was on a call with one of my contacts who she and her team, they're all operating in a remote environment now. But she said one thing that was really great that her organization was doing is they had a bit of a birthday club. So how that worked is a member of the team would arrange to have the delivery of a birthday cake to one of their team members. And that really resonated with me and just warmed my heart. Imagine you're in isolation, you're working from home, you're crazy, you're juggling a lot of different things and you have this unexpected delivery and it's a birthday cake from your team at work. I just thought that was so phenomenal. Um, and that's just one example. There are lots of other things that you can do to be creative. There are lots of um, online e-cards that you can use to either thank people, encourage people, motivate them, support them, just acknowledging them in some ways. Um, I know we have a number of chats that came in, so I definitely look forward to hearing um, what some of our participants today have found effective. Um, here, number three, I just want to touch on this really quickly. Be mindful of the culture you create. Um, and the reason why I say that is what I've observed um, throughout my career is a team is often a reflection of their leader. <laughs> So bear that in mind, a team is often a reflection of their leader. So when you have developed your team and you've given them a voice and they're clear in your expectations, they're clear in priorities and what to do, they're going to be able to operate whether or not you're right there with them. They're gonna be able to take the lead, they're gonna be able to move things forward and you're not gonna have that bottleneck dynamic because they don't know or they're uncertain. So you really want to think about creating opportunities for your teams to just really, you know, be empowered and feel confident in themselves. Now, here I have get support. Now, support is very, very important. You cannot be a leader without having some level of support. And what will support look like? So it can look very different. And it shouldn't just be one thing. There should absolutely be variety. So I encourage leaders to make sure they themselves have a mentor or a sponsor, someone who has a seat at the table who can advocate for them if and when needed. But also thinking about your peers, thinking about other people who you can use as sounding boards. You know, we all have challenges. And it's important for leaders to be able to weave others in um, to just bounce ideas off or to vent. That's important too. The other thing is if you feel you need real support, 
you can consider using a coach. So I am hired by both individual clients and organizational clients to help them with their leadership, um, you know, their leadership presence, their leadership skills, their leadership challenges um, that they might face, or just building a higher performing team. Because these are things that it takes time and you wanna nurture and develop your teams as well as yourself. So if you feel like you need structure and support in that way, definitely feel free to contact me. My contact information is on one of the slides coming up. And I know Melissa is going to share information with the participants following our, our call this afternoon. So now I'd like to open up the floor for Q&A. So as I mentioned before, I know there were a lot of chats that came in. So I just wanna open it up to Q&A. Um, any questions that participants may have? Hey, Sharon. So we've had a couple of questions already um, come in. Um, so I'm hoping you can uh, answer a few of these for us in the time we have left. Okay. Um, interesting one uh, right off the bat. What is one mistake that you witness leaders making more frequently than others? Ah, that's a great question. I would say the biggest mistake right now is it's twofold. So it's operating in reactive mode and not prioritizing. So there are a lot of unexpected things that are popping up. And I feel like a lot of leaders are just in reactive mode, putting out fires, putting out fires, putting out fires, rather than laying out and outlining how they can go about prioritizing things and setting themselves up and their teams up for success beyond the immediate day-to-day -day challenges and day-to-day -day fires. Because when you're in reactive mode for too long, there's that tendency to remain in reactive mode for a very, very long period of time. So long being six months. So it's really hard to, again, tackle that taking inventory piece and seeing those strides if you're living in re reactive mode day to day. Great, great. Uh, here's, a, here's another question that a couple people seem to have um, and it's about managing up uh, mm -hmm. So Allison asks, I have a supervisor that's very threatened by others' okay. leadership. How can I give her uh, or give me uh, space to grow? How can I help her give me space to grow? That is a tremendously great question, Allison. Um, thank you for that. So managing up, this again ties into communication. You know, fundamentally people are people. And, you know, we all have our insecurities. We all have things that we worry about. But having open communication, it allows you to build rapport with your boss and also establish trust. So when I'm working with my private clients, one of the things I encourage them to do, particularly if they're stepping into a new role or if they get a new manager, is to take the time to find out what is important to that person. Very, very, very key what's important to that person and how can you help them achieve their goals? When you ask those questions and when you create that dynamic, you're gonna, you're gonna experience a shift. So that person, whether it's a manager, whether it's a peer, they're gonna view you as an ally who they can trust because they're going to see that one, you have an interest, you're taking the time to ask the question, but two, that you're, you're supportive of them. And as time goes by and they can see you taking action towards helping them with their goals, they're gonna be appreciative of it. And also you can in turn share what your goals are. And there's a greater likelihood they're going to want to support you in achieving what you would like to, to tackle for yourself. Terrific. All right, I think we have time for a couple more. What are okay. your thoughts on trying to develop the leadership skills of your boss? <laughs> so another really great question, developing the leadership skills of your boss. So I can interpret that two ways. So either you're trying to model those skills within yourself, or maybe your boss needs um, a little leadership development. Um, That's how I interpreted that question. Okay, so I'll answer it in that way. So 
this is this is very similar to the managing up piece. Um, another piece of advice I give to my private coaching clients is to really it's twofold. So one, observe, observe the patterns and the behaviors of your boss, and two, directly ask them. So. With my private clients, one interview question I encourage them to ask is, what is their boss's leadership style? I love getting information directly from the horse's mouth and really think about their response. So some people you know, are very hands-on and involved and in more extreme cases, they're micromanagers and others are very hands-off. They will disappear, you will not see them, and you won't know what their expectations are. So again, tying in communication into this, it's really important that you have that open dialogue to get a sense of how would that person describe their leadership style, um, coupled with what are you observing, um, even at a, a more basic level. Some people are email people, some people are phone people. You might send your boss five emails and get no response then you know you should pick up the phone just so that your frustration level isn't building and you can move things forward. Um, but again, observe and communicate with that boss just to get a sense of, of what their leadership style is. Okay, great advice. Uh, a couple more. Um, how do you stay in leader mode and not allow your empathy or sympathy to get in the way of leading? That is a great question. I love yeah. all the questions during our, our lunch and learn this afternoon. So I had an interesting experience once. Um, I was hired by an international bank to work with one of their leaders who was in that transactional space. He was a phenomenal leader. That's why he was promoted into his role, but he was very involved in the day-to-day -day things. And then he was promoted and we worked together in shifting to that transformational mindset. So thinking about the bigger picture. Now, right now there's a lot going on and people are really, really overwhelmed by so much in terms of you know, what's taking place in the media, in terms of what's taking place in their homes, in terms of work demands, in terms of figuring out technology. There's a lot. To deal with. Um, I would say for you, you have to create that balance and it's, it's challenging for you as a leader. So I, I absolutely get that. I understand that. I would say definitely demonstrate empathy to your team members. Let them know you care about them. Let them know you're there for them. Let them know you want to support them in any way they can, that any way that you can. And the reason why you want to do that is you want to keep their minds at ease. Um, nothing good comes out of people who feel overwhelmed, overworked, and who don't have support. I would say weave in your vision into your communication with your team members, because that can serve as a source of inspiration for them. When they know where you'd like to move and where you want to go and how they can add value in that way, in that area, they're gonna feel inspired and they're going to see and realize the impact of what they're doing and how much it's going to mean to you as a leader because you are aware of their challenges and you know you are demonstrating empathy um, for what they what they're dealing with. So, you know, it's it's again that that balance, but being very conscious of that balance and being both someone who is really demonstrating and showing empathy for your team, as well as creating that vision and sharing that vision with them. Oh, great. Uh, here's another interesting question. I'm, I'm sure we've all run into this situation. Uh, what's your recommendation for working with individuals who have excuses for unmet expectations? <laughs> Oh, that, that's a lovely question. And anyone who has spent any time in human resources will always be tickled by that. It's common. So don't feel like you're alone. Um, it's, it's a very common occurrence. It's happened since I think the beginning of time. So I, you know, I've always been of the mindset of trying to work with, with what you have and develop people. Now, there are gonna be some instances in which there's nothing you can do <laughs> to help people become more motivated, more inspired, or to do what's expected of them. They, they, 
there are situations where that just is what it is and it's not going to change. Um, but for the most part, I think people do want to be given the opportunity to show what they can do. And a lot of that starts with, again, the communication, the conversations, letting them know how vital they are to the team, how important the work is that they do, letting them know how their, their piece contributes to the bigger picture and letting them know why it's significant. It's really hard for people to not be committed when they're aware of the importance of what they're doing and how it impacts so many different people, areas of the business, the work, the clients or customers who are benefiting from what's being done. So I would say really communicating. Also, I'll add to that, taking time to find out what does that person want to get out of the work they do. Again, this ties into what I mentioned earlier about giving them a voice. When people articulate what they want, there's a natural commitment that tends to happen. It's harder for them to not show up. It's harder for them not to follow through when they've said and articulated what they want to accomplish, what they want to achieve, asking them about their own career goals and ways in which you can support them in those areas and put them on the path to getting there. So again, you might give them stretch opportunities that might feel a little uncomfortable, but if they say, hey, I want to assume this higher position within one to two years, okay, then you can have a discussion about what steps are going to need to be taken to get there, and that can serve as a source of inspiration for that particular employee. Yeah, great, some great advice there. Let's, let's, um, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Um, okay. So um, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. Um, but since Sharon said, you know, feel free to reach out to her directly. Um, so for our last question, any advice for a new leader um, in supporting their team while the new leader is still learning their role? Yes, great, great, great question. So this reminds me of one of my clients who I worked with. Um, it's funny, I worked with her when she started in her new position and she's been in that role for about two years now. And, you know, she's had to add new members to her staff. She's had to learn her role. She's had to manage up and, you know, navigate all the different aspects of leadership. I mean, again, it's about that balance. So as a leader, one, you want to make sure you're, creating the important relationships that you need to be successful. So that means you really developing a strong relationship and network with your boss, your boss's boss, and your peers. That's really, really, really key. You want to have a presence. You want people to know who you are, why you're there, what you're working on. And if you need support, you want to ask for that support early and often. Um, you don't want to just kind of fade into the background and ask questions that you should have had the answers to within your first six months on the job. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is, as you think about your team, I would say regular communication with your team members. So getting a sense of, you know, how long have they been there? What are they working on? What are projects they've really enjoyed? What motivates them? What are their challenges? Just so that you can use that information um, to one, identify common recurring themes and threads, but also to really think about how can you develop these um, staff members who report into you? What are some learning opportunities that you can create for them or help them to create in partnership with you? Sharon, thank you so much. That hour zipped by. Um, I think you packed an enormous amount of information into one hour. Uh, gave uh, a lot of us um, some, some great information and, and strategies to think about. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us today. I will send a follow-up email with Sharon's contact information should you want to reach out or have additional questions. Um, I appreciate you all joining us today. Uh, hopefully, um, we'll see you back for future webinars. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Great. Thank yeah, you, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.